Okay, so I have a couple of announcements to start off with. So one thing is that we have a um, we have a forum. You guys should go sign up. The link is on the main website under the discuss tab. I can make it look, look more like it. Would, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not micromanaging the forum this time unlike what we do for 125, so you guys should all be able to sign up, create an account. Um, once you do that, join, and uh, that's where we're going to be posting announcements and things like that in the future. So um, if you guys have questions about things, yeah? It's saying, sorry, access to this form is invited. Yeah, hold on. That's probably my fault. No wonder only Harsh and I have signed up. Uh, All right. Uh, you try now. You may need to like reload the the core forum page. Let me see if that's time. <coughs> Try it now. Are you guys in? Yep. Sweet. Does it redirect you through the Illinois login? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. That's right. Sweet. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to take a departure from our little lessons on, on a sort of Kotlin and the small, and we're going to talk about how to set up in a, a development environment um, and how to sort of set up a small project in Kotlin using IntelliJ. Um, along the way, you know, my goal here is to kind of explain some things to you that may have been confusing in the past. Some of you guys have used an environment like this. If you took 125 and did things in Android Studio, Android Studio is based on an IntelliJ. Um, but there were probably some aspects of those projects that you didn't understand. Um, and this is something we'll come back to. So my goal here is over the course of the next few classes, to get to the point where we can actually build like a small web backend in Kotlin and talk about some of the features. Can, can you guys let me talk rather than talking for like the entire entire hour? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm right here, like 10 feet away. Thanks. Um, all right, so the first step here, if you, how many people have Java installed on their machine? Some version of Java? How many people have IntelliJ installed on their machine? Okay, so um, everyone please install IntelliJ on your computer over the next five minutes. This is not difficult to do. Um, if you Google IntelliJ IDEA, you want the community edition of this. I already have it. I'll just kind of show you where to get it. Um, if you go to the download. You want the community version. Um, or you can get the ultimate one if you want. I don't care. You, just don't, have, you don't have to pay any money for it. Is there a student license for this? Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. So we're not going to need that for this class, but but if you'd like to do that, go for it. If not, get the community version. Questions? Yeah. You you probably want to update it if you've if you haven't used it for a while. So the way you do that, open it up. And. Go up here, hit check for updates. I just updated it earlier today. Uh, the latest version is um, 2019 3 3. They don't have a 2020 release yet. Yeah, it's probably time to update. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
All right, so um, so the, the other thing you're going to need to do is install Java if you don't have Java already. Um, Android Studio, so those of you that took 125 installed Android Studio. Android Studio comes with kind of everything in the box, including Java. Um, IntelliJ does not. IntelliJ relies on a Java installation on your machine. So again, if you Google install Java, this is not, this is an old version. Let's see if we can get like Java 13. Uh, 13 SDK. All right, there you go. So there's some license you're going to have to accept to get this, and then you have to choose a package that's appropriate to your machine. Um, I've already done this, so again, I'm not going to go through it. But the so so just as a reminder, whenever you're developing Java applications, you want the um, Java SDK. The Java runtime environment is only the Java virtual machine. It doesn't come with the compiler. Um, Kotlin, you might w wonder why we need Java given that we're using Kotlin. So um, Kotlin compiles to bytecode, so we need the Java virtual machine to run our Kotlin programs. Um, Kotlin also relies on the Java standard libraries, which come with the Java SDK in order to work. All right. is watching the tutorial. Okay, so I'm going to, how, how many people have IntelliJ installed? How many people have IntelliJ and Java installed? All right. The rest of you guys work on, you guys are probably frobbing the internet right now. I'll give you a few minutes to complete these steps. If you have a problem, raise your hand and I'll try to help you with it. If you're done, lean over and help your neighbor. I suspect everybody is Stuck. I should have told you guys to do this earlier. Sorry. Simultaneously trying to download IntelliJ. All right. So while you guys are downloading that, let me um, let me do something quickly. Just I'll, I'll just get a little bit ahead of where you guys are. You guys don't need to follow these steps yet. I'll come back and um, and we'll get them in a minute. All right. Let's see. Let's just use this. That's fine. Again, I'm not not expecting you guys to follow these steps. I wanna what I wanna do is start showing you a little bit about Gradle. Anybody remember Gradle? Anybody used Gradle since I took 125? Okay. Um, anyone understand what Gradle is? Want to try to define it for the class? Want to take a stab at it? Anybody? Yeah. Is it like a package manager? It's one of the things that, that Gradle can do, so that's not a bad start to an answer. That's one of the things that Gradle does. What else? <laughs> Again, anyone who's worked with Gradle a little bit wanna? What's, what's an analog to Gradle? Some of you guys are taking 225 or have taken 225 or have worked with systems that are similar to Gradle. Make, yeah. Uh, how many people have used Make before? Okay, like 225, do they use Make? Is that what, okay. So, so Gradle's a, a build system. Right. The idea behind Gradle is it allows you to perform certain common tasks that are associated with developing software. Right. So, so one of the so let me actually back up a second. So, I work with a lot of students on software development projects, and you guys are all super smart, right? And a lot of you, I think, you know, can make a lot of progress on a lot of re really interesting projects. But let me tell you something you guys are terrible at, which is setting up development environments, like terrible at it. Okay. I've seen people doing like incredibly inane stuff where it's like I need to, in order to run my program, I need to compile it on one machine and then copy the code to some other machine and then run it there. And you're like, you do want to make forward progress, right? Um, so some of the stuff that we're going to go through today, I'm, I, you know, I'm, and, and you know, it may sound funny, but to be honest, like if 
writing code is frustrating enough. If the process of doing it is even more frustrating because you haven't set up things very well, then you know, you're just, it's not going to be very much fun. Right? So this is something that, to be honest, is something that's worth devoting a little bit of time and energy to, sometimes a lot of time and energy to, more than most of you do, which is setting up a sane build environment. So we're going to walk through not only a little bit about how Gradle works, but eventually, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but we'll install a couple of tools that I consider to be an important part of a sane uh, development environment. All right, but let's, let's look at Gradle first. Okay. So this is a file in my project. And if you initialize your project similarly, you'll have a similar file. This is at the root of my project. This is called build.gradle.kts. Right. The KTS extension here indicates that this is a Kotlin script. And Kotlin scripts are really interesting. Right? We'll talk about them in a minute. Right? The build.gradle part indicates that this is a file where Gradle expects to find configuration information about, about your project. This is where you put information about how to build the project. Right? Uh, information that Gradle uses to figure out how to help you with certain tasks. So, as David pointed out, one of the things that Gradle will do is it'll allow you to import libraries into your project. So you may wonder, like, if I want to use an external library, there's some really useful, you know, code, for example, writing a web backend that we're going to use, that we're going to import, right? There's really a useful testing library that I want to use. So there's a lot of useful libraries out in the world. There's a library for working with JSON. There's multiple libraries for working with JSON and Kotlin and Java, right? How do I add those to my project, right? I mean, you find people that are like, oh, well, you go and download the Java files and stick them into your program, and that's not something that we do in the 20th century. Um, so, you know, we're, Gradle is going to help us with this. Gradle will also uh, take, allow us to take the source code from our project and convert it into a variety of different useful artifacts. So, for example, I can take all the code in my project and produce one file that I can then run using the Java command that will run my program, right? So that's pretty useful. All right, so let me, and we're, we're, we're going to, as we go through this example, we're going to work with this file quite a bit, right? So let me just walk through what's in here. Gradle organizes build logic um, using this concept of a plugin. So Gradle plugins provide different uh, capabilities that you can add to your project, right? Right now, the only plugin that we're using is a, is a plugin that provides access to the Kotlin compiler, okay? So you'll see that um, there's this Kotlin syntax, and then I'm telling Kotlin what type of code I'm producing. Kotlin can also produce native code, so it can actually compile to um, machine code that can run on your program, and it can also compile to JavaScript. So we're telling uh, Gradle that we're going to use Kotlin, and we're going to compile to the JVM. We want to produce bytecode. And then there's a version. So this is the version of Kotlin that we're using as part of this pro uh, uh, in this project, which is 1.3.6.1. That's the latest one, latest stable one. This is information about your project. And what we can talk about what to put in these values for a minute. But this is, uh, this is information used when you publish your project. The next two blocks are information about dependencies that your project has. The first block, the repositories block, tells Gradle where to get them. So there's a number of different source sites that host um, Java libraries. Maven is one of them. Okay? There's another one called JCenter. Google hosts some of its own dependencies in other places. So um, what we're telling Gradle is, I want you to look for the dependencies in my project in this particular location. So that's all I have to do, and now Gradle knows you know, where to look for them and also knows how to find them and it's going to download them automatically and add them to my project. The next block actually tells Gradle what, my, what things my project depends on. And because we started this, you know, as a brand new project, the only dependency right now is on the Kotlin standard library. So this says I want to use, and this is because I'm using Kotlin, um, the, the standard library for Java 8. Okay, that's the only, but this gives me access to now all of the Kotlin sort of nice features that we've been looking at. Um, this implementation block um, 
means that this is something that's used by my program when it runs. We're also going to see test implementation because there's code that we use to test our programs. That code doesn't need to exist in the final product. It's only used during testing. So Gradle also allows us to say certain libraries are only used during testing. Down here, I see another configuration block. And this is essentially telling the Kotlin. This is providing some information for the Kotlin compiler. Right? This is telling it which JVM version to target. So the Kotlin compiler produces bytecode. This is telling it to produce bytecode that is compatible with Java 8. So w there's one th interesting thing about this. What does this look like, this file? I mean, what we've been talking about is configuration, right? This is configuration for Gradle, right? But what does this look like? This doesn't really look like a typical configuration file. It also has a .kts extension. Anybody want to take a guess what this actually is? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. Gradle, Gradle, pr gra Gradle will process this information to figure out how to configure my project. But again, what does this look like? Yeah. Does this look like JSON? No, this is, this is not a JSON file. What do you think? Well, you're using, a, you're using a scary word, right? I like the first part of that answer. This looks like Kotlin code. Right? So remember, in Kotlin, I can have a function, a higher order function that takes a function as, a, as an argument. Right? This is a block. This looks a lot like how we called map. Right? Same thing here. This looks like an actual function call. Right? There's some function called Kotlin that takes an argument, which is a string. IntelliJ even knows what the name of that argument is. Right? And then I'm passing the result to this other function, right? which is doing something. Right? There's some function called Maven Central that returns something. Right. So Kotlin, and, and we'll come back and we'll talk about this feature later, but, but Kotlin can be used to produce um, what's called a domain-specific language. So this is Kotlin code. This is interpreted as Kotlin code. You'll see in a minute, if we want, we can put like print statements in here. It's, it, it, parts of this can be executed like Kotlin code. Um, you know, so for example, group inversion, we're actually reassigning values to variables that were assigned before this started, right? Kotlin scripts are files that can contain kind of loose Kotlin code. They're also executed in this with this idea of a context, which is kind of like some of the variables and functions that were predefined before the content of the script. So if you might say like, where is this tasks function defined? Where is this dependencies function defined? Where is the repositories function defined? Right. And the answer is kind of before the script is run. Right. You don't see any import statements or anything at the top here. Right. So again, this is like kind of you know, an, an interesting application of Kotlin. Right. Because of Kotlin's support for things like trailing lambdas, um, it can be used to produce something that is executed as code, but is actually also serving as configuration for the project. All right, how many people are ready to start a project now? They have Java, we have IntelliJ. Okay, let's, let's, let's just walk through this, I'll back up, and then those of you that are, that are waiting for things to download can watch the video and catch up. All right, let me just blow that guy away. Actually, I don't want that anymore. Uh, all right, so once you, we'll come back to talk about Gradle in a second, right? Once you have IntelliJ installed, you're going to choose new project. Over here on the left, you want to. We're going to make this a Gradle project. There are other build systems that you can use for Java. Maven is one of them. I would suggest, even though Gradle is not my favorite thing in the world, I would not suggest that you use Maven. Um, it's older and and kludgier. Um, so, this can be this this new project dialog gives me a choice up here of which SDK I want to use. Um, here I'm choosing to use Java 13. Um, 
you can choose any version of Java that's above 8. You shouldn't install anything that's below 8. 8 is itself pretty old. Down here, I get to choose what uh, type of code my, my project's going to contain, and this is something I can choose later, right? I don't, we're not going to include any Java code in our project. You can. You can, you can create projects that are mixed Java and Kotlin, right? So I can have both in my, in the same project, and they can call each other, right? I can use jo Java code from Kotlin. I can use Kotlin code from Java. In fact, it's really common to use Java code from Kotlin because a lot of the libraries that we may be using are actually probably implemented in Java, but you can call them from Kotlin. Right. But for this project, I'm going to say I'm only going to use Kotlin code. And then I also want this Kotlin DSL build script. So I need to click this as well. That's what, if you don't do this, that build file is called build.gradle. And it's, in, it's, actually, um, it's actually code written in a language called Groovy. You do not want to learn Groovy, particularly not just to, so that you can read a, um, not th just so that you can read a Gradle configuration file. It's not worth it. All right, so you can choose a name and a lo location for this. I'm going to just leave it called untitled, but actually let's call this hello. That's what we're going to do with it. All right. And then Gradle's going to, um, IntelliJ is going to work for a minute. Um, you'll see that, and, and don't, you know, don't stop it, right? When it's done, what you're going to see is that so this is my hello project, and there are, this is a standard project layout for uh, Java programs. This is called the Maven standard project layout. So I have a root directory, I have a source directory in there, that's where I'm going to put all my source code. Inside the source directory, I typically have two subdirectories. One is called main, the other is called test. The main subdirectory scores, stores all of the code for my actual project the test subdirectory stores testing code, right? Code that I write in order to test the rest of my code. Now here's this build.gradle file that I looked at before, okay? And this should look pretty much identical to what we saw in the past. Let me close some of these windows, so, okay. Any questions? David. It might take a minute if it's if you just created it to uh, okay. to to be created. Wait wait until the, there might be something going on at the bottom. Yeah, right? the f the yeah, the first time you set this up, Gradle is downloading some stuff and things like that. So it may take a minute before you can it will create finish creating the source directories. All right. So 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 again, this is the configuration file for Gradle, right? But but Gradle is supposed to help us do stuff, right? Like build our program or run tests or whatever. So how do I get it to do that? Okay. So over here on the right of your project, you should have this Gradle tab. And if I go over here and open up the tasks area, so now we're actually, this is an enumeration of all the different things that Gradle knows how to do to my project. Okay. So for example, there's a clean task that will clean the project and remove all the files that were generated by any previous build, right? There's a task called build, right? That does kind of what you, what it sounds like, right? So if you go through these, these are sort of organized into different categories. Uh, there's a doc, there's a Java doc task. So Gradle knows how to generate Java documentation. And then down here, there's some verification tasks. So there's the test task. Right. This will run the test that I've defined in my project. And then there's a, there's a test called check. There's a step called check. Right now, I think all check will do is it'll run the tests. But later, once we start to add some other, um, both like a linter and a smell checker to our project, tests will also run those tasks. Right. Okay. So one of the reasons we're doing this is because, you know, and, and I think, you know, again, you think about Kotlin being a, a relatively new modern language. Um, it is very much amenable to be using in an IDE. I'm not saying that like learning in our playground isn't a good way to do it because if you know how to type stuff, um, you'll get more, more work done faster. But having autocomplete is really, really helpful, right? And it's actually a nice way of exploring what the language can do. All right, so actually let's, let's, write, let's write a little bit of Kotlin code. Let's kind of write hello world. Um, just because I'm OCD, I'm going to remove these Java directories. 
they're sort of offending me, so I'm gonna get rid of that one and get rid of this one too. I don't have any I don't have any Java code. Okay, great. So now in my Kotlin um, directory, I'm gonna hit new Kotlin class and I'm gonna call this main. All right. It's actually important to call this main. Actually, you know what? It doesn't really matter. You can call this whatever you want. Right? So this file is now located in my Kotlin subdirectory. Right? And in here, this is, so this is a Kotlin file. It's a .kt file. Kotlin files have a different syntax than Kotlin scripts. But keep in mind, this is Kotlin. And so I can do nice things in Kotlin like this, which is I can write a top-level function. This is valid Kotlin code. There's no class required, right? I just wrote, just wrote a function, okay? Now, like I said, just to give you sort of a hint of, 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 of how, you know, the type of things you can do with, in, you know, the intelligent completion. So let's say I have a list, um, right? So Kotlin is already helping me, right? So I'm going to give it some values. And then I do list dot, and you can see all of these different operators Right. Um, so this is a nice, you know, rather than having to remember that there's a shuffle method and a sort method, and you know, all of these different, a lot of these are higher order functions, right? That take, you know, um, that take a function, right? You know, this is one of the nicer things about Kotlin as a language is that it does define more out of the box for you, right? You know, lists by themselves come with a lot of, you know, different features that are sort of, you know, built into them, right? All right, but, but now, now our task is figuring out how are we going to get this thing to, to, to work. So we can, so at this point, I have some code, right? I can build that code by clicking this button, and that's going to build my project. You can see the little wheel spin at the bottom, but like nothing happened, right? So how do I actually run my project? press a little green arrow there's no green arrow oh let's try let's try this actually let's see if this will actually work oh look at that that's awesome well, that's one way to do it right there you go however let me show you show you a different way right so if I'm building an actual runnable application right um, I, I so so this is a nice way to do this but I may want to be able to do things like pass command line arguments or whatever um, and I also may want to tell Gradle that this is something that can be run. Right? So let's. So let, this is an example of making a change to our Gradle file so that we can support a different feature. Right? So not every Java application. Do you have a question, or are you just stretching? Yeah. So not every Java application makes sense to run. Right? Like some of them are like servers that just sit there, you know, quietly or whatever. Right? So this feature doesn't come you know, built in out of the box. But if I'm building something that's actual runnable application, what I can do is I can add a plugin to my project. This plugin is called application. And you can see that it'll even auto-complete it for me. Okay? So now I've changed my, my Gradle configuration file. Whenever I do that, it's a good idea to resync. This sort of forces Gradle to kind of like reload the configuration file, reconfigure the build or whatever, okay? Now when I go over here to my tasks menu, you'll notice that there's a new section called application. These are tasks that were added by this plugin. So now I've told Gradle what I'm producing here is not a library that might just be used by other programs, but this is actually something that's runnable. I can run it. So let's do that. Well, let's try to do that, okay? So if I click on this, I get this error message. Okay. There's no main class specified. So what do, what do you guys think the problem is here? David. Yeah, it doesn't know where to start. I haven't told it what method I want it to start in. Or actually, so it's always going to start by running a method called main, but I haven't told it where that method is. Right. And so... All right, so now let me show you the most important the most important thing to know how to do when you are working with Gradle, which is Google that shit. Um, so I'm not kidding, right? 
and 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 there's there's an art and a science to this, right? Which I'm a, I'm I'm hopefully going to be able to show you. So, okay, um, here's the here's one of the so so. I've worked with Gradle now for several years. I am still I still find myself taking way longer to accomplish things that feel like they should be really simple. Okay, and so I will caution you about this. Right, first of all. When you start Googling around and you find stuff about Gradle, a good percentage of the time, the Gradle configuration that you're looking at is in Groovy, right? Not in Kotlin, okay? But Gradle can use both Groovy and Kotlin to configure itself. If you try to use Groovy code in a Kotlin file, it is not going to go well, okay? Um, let's see here. Maybe this is an actual post on... Um, Yeah, that's not going well. Okay, we're going to back out. I'm telling you, this is... So, sometimes adding Kotlin as a keyword will help. No. All right, well, let's try a different approach. So, application is actually a plugin that's built into Gradle. You can tell that because I didn't have to provide it a version or any other information. We'll see some plugins in a minute that I can use that are actually external. Okay. Many of the Gradle plugins that we're going to use configure themselves by using a block that is named after that plugin. So if I start typing application, well, I might need, here we go. Whenever you get this message, this you need to apply because this usually means that I installed a new plugin, right? So now, in order to configure a Gradle plugin, what I'll typically do is I'll open up, I'm not saying all of them have this, but many of them do, right? I open up a configuration block with the same name as the plugin. And then let's see if I can figure out what my options are in here. Um, okay, so there's, there's a variable I can set inside this called main class name. And what is my main class name? Okay. So now let's try this. Let's set it equal to main, right? Because my main method is inside a, f a file called main.kt. So I feel like this is going to work, OK? Let's try running that again. OK, so now I'm getting a different error. So now I've told the application plugin where my main method is, but I can't find it. Any any guesses on what's going on here? I have a file called main.kt. I don't have a main class in there, but that shouldn't really matter, right? So when when Kotlin, so you have to think about, you know, how does Kotlin actually compile this to Java code? In Java, everything has to be wrapped in a class. I can't have a top-level function in a Java file. This isn't valid Java code. Kotlin allows me to do this, but behind the scenes, it's playing, some, it's playing some games with me. And one of the things that it's doing, let's actually go, let's have some fun here. Let's, uh, let's open up our terminal window. I know this is always dangerous. Um, so you might be wondering, like, where are the build, where are the results of my build going? And, and they're going into a directory called build. And let me pull this up a little bit. You guys not, may, may not, well, I don't want to do a tree in here. So if I go into my classes directory, subdirectory, you can see a little bit about the structure of my project is emerging here. My main.kt file got compiled into a class file called what? Main kt. So in certain situations when Kotlin compiles Kotlin code inside a file like main kt into a class file, it appends kt to that class file. But it doesn't create a class called main, it creates a class called main.kt. So now if I go back here, modify my configuration file, now, now this is going to work. Sweet. Okay. Whenever you see this, just hit import, it's fine. Okay, good. Any questions at this point? So at this point we have gaining some understanding of kind of like what some of the basic files are in this project and what they're doing. We've made a change to our 
Gradle configuration file, and we've been able to run our program. Right. So, so how, let me ask a. So let's 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 move on to something else. So, how many people here write write tests when they run code, when they work on code, like on every project, religiously? Okay. How many people in here write code at all, like for projects? Okay, so I guess now my question is, those of you that don't run tests, how do you get your program to do anything? This is a common, this is a common, so, so here's, so a lot of you I suspect probably run the code, right? Is that how you test it? You like run the program and see what it does? Yeah. Oh yeah, well no, 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 but see I'm not even talking about how do you debug. That's a different, I'm not talking about how do you get it to do anything, right? So let's say I have a function here. Let's say I want to write a function and test it. Let's write a function that adds two numbers together. It's pretty basic. Let's put that over here, right? I want to do fun add, and I'm going to take first int, second int. Function's going to return an integer, and I'm going to return first plus second. All right, cool. So I've got my new add function. But let's say I just wanted to see what happens if I add like five and six, right? How would you guys normally do this? Call it where? Call it in the main method, right? Okay, we can do that. So now I can print the correct result of calling add on four and five. And hopefully this is right. Okay, that seems to work. So let me just suggest to you something. This is a really terrible way of working on small pieces of your program. There's a lot of times when you're writing programs where you want to work on like one specific piece of functionality. And you want to be able to test it. And I'm not even talking about testing it, like testing it to see if it's correct. I'm just talking about testing it to see if it does anything, right? Like does it do the right thing if I give it like a simple input? This is one of the one of the reasons to write test cases. I think that we don't actually explain to you to you very well in, in a lot of our other courses, right? I'll tell you about the other reason to write test cases in a minute. So, so we're we're going to add testing to this project, right? It's not that hard to do. There are a lot of different testing libraries out there that you can use to test your code. Many, many of them. The one that I'm going to show you how to use is one that I like. You may have different preferences, but. I'll show you how to use one. The one I'm we're gonna I'm gonna show you how to use is something called Kotlin test. Okay, so if you Google Kotlin test, um, you find its web page, and there are typically some instructions on the web page for how to install it. There's actually quite a bit of uh, preface here about different ways that we can write tests. Um, okay, so now. Now we get into a lot of libraries that you find for Java or Kotlin will have something that looks like this, right? This is the information. So see how it says build.gradle? Unfortunately, this is in Groovy, right? Um, do they have a Kotlin example? Ah, there it is. Sweet, okay. That's much better. Um, so this is essentially what we need to incorporate into our build.gradle.kts file so that we can use this library, okay? So let's do that. So there are two things I need to add. The first one is I need to tell Gradle that I have a dependency on, I have a new dependency for this project. Now I need to put that inside my existing dependencies block. Okay, so this is a new dependency. Every, all of your dependencies should go in this one place. Mm -hmm. I usually like to separate my test dependencies and my normal ones by spaces. All right, so let's look at this a little bit just so you guys have some sense of what's in here. Test implementation says that this is something required to test my code. It's not something that required that my code needs to run, right? It's only used during testing. So the idea is later, when we build a full version of this app and we want to deploy it somewhere, I don't need to incorporate all of the testing dependencies that I don't use, okay? This string has three parts to it. And I'm pointing this out because you'll find if you're trying to use Java libraries, the Java library system is sort of a mess, right? But if you're trying to use them, sometimes you'll find what are called Maven coordinates, and sometimes they're formatted differently, right? In Gradle, there are three parts of this that are separated by colons, okay? io.kotlin test is like the group, okay? 
Um, this is an artifact, Kotlin test-runner-junit5. And then there's a version number over here at the right. So this says I want to use version 3.3.0 of the artifact Kotlin test-junit from this particular source. Okay. So this kind of identifies all three parts that Gradle now needs to know about in order to find this library. Okay. So what Gradle is going to do when I give it this information, the next time I sync my project, is it's actually going to go off and find this code for me and grab it and put it into my project. And I don't need to do anything about it. I don't have to download anything. I don't have to worry about where it goes. It's just there. Just to make sure that you understand how this works, I'm going to break this by putting in a non-existent dependency. So now if I try to sync the project, you're going to see, so Gradle is realize that something has changed. Um, oh, oh, you know what? Actually, I think that's an existing dependency of Kotlin test. I think they're, I think Kotlin test is up to like 343 now. Let's try this. All right, let me try a real non-existing dependency of, nope, 35? I, I don't actually believe this. All right, well, we'll use the one that, that we said we were supposed to be able to use. All right. Okay, so that's step one in using this, right? I guess I'm not doing a good job of plugging in a non-existent Kotlin test dependency. They must, uh, anyway. Um, what happened when we, s when we synced our project is that Gradle, like I said, it went off and it found the specific version of this library that I wanted. It found the, the compiled code for that and it stuffed it into my project and so now I can use it. Keep in mind that I cannot use it in my in the, my code in, in the code in the main part of my application. This is a test implementation dependency, meaning if I try to import it here, it's not going to work. So for example, if I go up to the top and I say import Kotlin, well, let's look at the example import down here, right? Um, I don't know if they even show that, do they? No, they don't, okay. So if I try to use like a string spec, which is part of the library, um, it's not, and I try to, it's not going to be able to find this, right? So I need to write some test code. So let's add a file to the testing part of our project. I'll call this, you can call this whatever you want, come up with your own naming convention. So I'm going to call this test, test main. This is going to contain, a lot of times I like to have, you know, a file, if I have code in main.kt, I like to have a file called test main that contains the code that I use to test the code in the other file. All right. So now let's go back and look at Kotlin test. Um, Kotlin test actually has a bunch of different ways that you can write tests. Um, this is probably the one that I like the most. It's the simplest. It's the most elegant. So this is the one that we're going to try to get to work. All right. And so, you know, when you read documentation like this, I mean, I'm fast forwarding to the end because I've used this library for a long time. But if you were finding this for the first time, you kind of have to pattern match a little bit here and try to figure out what's going on. And so here what we see is that if I use this particular style of testing, what I do is I write a description in English as a string of what my code should do or what this is testing about my code. And then I have a block. So this is, again, this is sort of a... a a block of code. This is an anonymous function that's going to be run. And then there's code in here and um, there's some code here that's checking certain properties of that. All right, so let's try doing something like this. So let's try calling this test main and we'll inherit from string spec. And so now you can see io.kotlintest.spec is something that I can import. And that's because I added that dependency a minute ago. Okay. So now let's just put in empty, we'll just put an empty test should pass, and we'll just do this. Okay. So this is our first test. It does nothing. However, we're not quite done adding. So if I, if I tried doing this now, and I tried going over here and don't going down to the verification step and running test, um, it's it's still acting as if there are no tests in the project, despite the fact that I just wrote. And the reason for this is that I missed this other step in adding this to my to my project, which is this part. Okay. So 
I'm going to take this, I'm going to add it to my build.gradle file. I wish I could tell you that every time you're using Gradle, you're going to have like a deep understanding of what this is doing. And I'm sorry, I can't guarantee that, right? Um, roughly speaking, what this is doing is it's saying all the tasks that are testing tasks should use the JUnit platform. That's a platform for running tests that Kotlin test is based on. All right, so now let's see. Let's, oh, no, nope, I don't want to do that. No. Let's resync Gradle, and then let's see if we can run our test. Okay, cool. And this is a lot easier to see if you have a larger monitor, but there's a nice display down here, and it says empty test should pass, and it passes because nothing bad happened. Okay. So now I actually have a way inside my test to run any code in my project I want. So now let's use this to actually run. So, so you know, I'm, I'm conflating two concepts here. So one concept is the ability to run any part of your program at any point during development. The second one is writing tests. So the two things are not necessarily always the same. So let's say I'm working on the add method. I'm going to put in a test case for it here. All right. When you're, when you start off writing methods, frequently you don't, you're kind of just exploring, right? You're just trying to figure out what's going on, right? You're just writing some code and you want to see what it does. So obviously this code, we know what it does and we could very e easily write some tests for it, but let's just play with it, right? So let's say I wanted to find out what happens. So I can do println add five and six. And now when I run my tests, no, this, this is an irritating message that we'll fix next time. I get some output here. So if I was, you know, if this was returning a list or whatever, so now I have a way of essentially running portions of my code, right, without needing this main method to do anything, right? And this is, you know, someone who has a little bit of experience in this area, this is a much more satisfying way to, to work on small parts of your project, right? Because at some point, your main method is actually going to have, if this is a real application, your main method is going to actually do stuff, right? And you don't want to be, I mean, how many people have written a program and they've had to, like, find a way to get it to do something over and over again, right? It's like, you know, it takes some command line arguments and I have to keep using the same arguments over and over to get it to do a particular thing so that I can test that thing. It's just the wrong way to approach it, right? So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use our... You know, our, you know, we're going to conflate both the concept of writing tests with the ability to run targeted parts of our code so that we understand how they work, and then we can build them up into larger things. All right, so for now, let's, let's actually test this, right? So we know that, um, and I'm going to show you some of the syntax from Kotlin test. And again, every testing library is different, right? This is Kotlin test syntax. So if I wanted to write a test for this, right? I would, s I would, it would look like this. That says the result of adding five and six should be 11, right? Now this is a, a nice way of, of writing this test. If I run it, I'm going to see that it works. If I messed up and my testing library doesn't do the right thing, then I'm going to get some information about what happened including what the problem was, right? So I expected 11, but the result I got was 9. Question? Uh, yeah, this has, to do, this has to do with logging that's used by um, Kotlin tests. This is not a problem, right? We'll fix it next time just to make it go away. I know it's a scary, you know, angry warning message, but it's not, it's not critical. All right. Any questions at this point? I think we're about five minutes from when we usually finish up, but I think we're kind of at a good stopping point here. Does David. Kotlin 
So the question is, is there a built-in, does Kotlin have like a standard way of writing tests? Um, I think there is a testing library that's supported by the Kotlin developers. I haven't used it because I feel like Kotlin tests had looked nicer to me right, when I started using it. Right? There are, pro I, I'm sure there are probably half a dozen, if not more, testing libraries that you can use. Right? Um, both in terms of like, so, so there's two parts to running tests. Right? One is kind of naming the test itself and defining the code that's supposed to be run. And then there's these things that are, for better words, these are kind of like ways of expressing things that should be true about the world, right? This we can do in a variety of different ways. So I can use an assertion. I can say assert add five, six is equal to 11. Um, or I could actually, Kotlin has something called require. Now it's mad at me because, yeah. So this is also valid Kotlin code. And actually, it's not a bad time to talk about these functions. Let me, uh, let me show what happens when I try to run this failing test. So, so this will still fail, right? And this test case still works, right? But now I don't get this nice error message. These matchers that come along with Kotlin tests are really designed to be readable, right? So the idea is like you read it from left to right. Adding 5 and 6 should be 11, right? And it's a little cleaner than this method. Just to close out today, one of the one of the nice uh, little things that Kotlin includes to make uh, your some of your error checking easily more easy is um, there are three predefined functions in Kotlin that you can use for error checking. The first is called require. Um, the second is called check, and then there's one called assert. So require looks something like this. Here's the syntax of it. So we could say require first is equal to second. And now what I can do is I can actually provide a custom error message that's shown if this isn't true. Right? So now I'll say first should be second. And let's put this all in one line. OK, so this is obviously a silly requirement for my add function to have, right? because most add functions allow me to add any two numbers. But this is something you can use throughout your Kotlin code. This is built in, okay? There's, an, there's a similar version of this that's called check, okay? It works identically in that, so, so how is this working? So again, this is, a, this is an example of a higher order function in Kotlin. The condition is checked if, the condition is not met, what happens is that an error is thrown. This throws an exception, which you guys may remember from Java, right? So you can see there's an illegal state exception, right? That's the exception that's thrown. And then in this uh, anonymous function, this needs to return a string. This is used as the message in the error, right? So here, where did it go? It was printed somewhere. Yeah, so here it's printing the error message from my, so this is an illegal state exception that contains the message that I've defined, right? Difference between check and require, let's see here. So check throws an illegal state exception. Require, again, works very similarly in terms of how it tests, but it produces an illegal argument exception. So the idea is that you use, requ you use um, require to check arguments. You get arguments to a function. Remember in the past, we've talked about this in 125, like how do you validate arguments, right? You check them and you throw an exception. Kotlin just provides a really nice way to do this, right? If you have an argument, you need something to be true about it. Let's say that I want both numbers to be positive. I can say something like first should be greater than equal to zero. And I'll say first should be positive. Don't use exclamation points. You only have a certain number of those in your life that you can use, so don't waste them. Um, and now you're going to see that this failed, and it provides an error message, right? So if you need to do argument validation, this is a much cleaner and more compact way of doing it, right? 
Um, check, on the other hand, is a good way to check things about the state of your function as it's running, right? This is a, these, are, these are both good debugging strategies, right? I use this a lot in my own code to express invariance about the program that I want to be true when the code runs, right? It's much better to have your code uh, error during testing or as you're, as you're working with it um, because of one of these. So, you know, if you think that there's something that's supposed to be true, right? So, for example, uh, I could say something like, this is, again, a silly example. I could say check that first plus second is greater than first um, and return result. Now, obviously, I'm, you know, this, this isn't necessarily true, but if, if I didn't understand how negative numbers worked, right, I might think that this was supposed to be the case. Um, that, you know, if I add something to another number, that the result should be bigger than the first number, right? Um, and I guess actually if, if first is, no, it doesn't matter, second is negative. If they're both positive, then I would be able to assert this. All right, so on Friday, we are going to, we'll continue with this example, um, and we're going to get to the point where we have a little uh, working web API. Very simple, right? But we'll talk about how to install the Kotlin tool for doing that, um, how to set that up as a project, how to access it on your machine, um, how to test it, and then we'll install a couple of tools that will allow you to write better Kotlin code, including a linter, and I guess what Harsh tells me people actually, has anyone used the word smell checker? Not spell checker, smell checker. Has anyone heard that term before? All right, well, we'll install one up front. All right, I'll see you guys then.